get into the meat of this, I just wanted to say thank you for, for this honor and thank you to Dr. Choate for that really wonderful uh, introduction and for introducing me to Milton and to Dr. Daly for being here as well and for kind of being a part of, of this journey. Thank you, thank you both so much. Um, so I guess I begin with a quote by Umberto Eco, who once defined human beings as storytelling animals. In this thesis, I seek to understand how the retelling and recreation of one particular story, the Judeo-Christian fall narrative, serves in the 17th century as a technology for making sense of transforming notions of language, representation, and selfhood. In particular, a study of John Milton's epic poem, Paradise Lost, engages these epistemic changes with and through the fall. As language shifts from primarily spoken to primarily written in the 17th century, signs lose their intrinsic connectedness to their meanings, and humanity loses its sense of embeddedness in the world. Paradise Lost, I contend, addresses these conceptual changes and their theological implications by mapping them onto the fall. The previous lost relationship to the cosmos informs Milton's prelapsarian world, and the new subjectivity of the 17th century becomes postlapsarian. Today I will pursue three main tasks. First, I will unpack how thought changed in the 17th century and why that change could suggest theological fallenness. Second, I will demonstrate that Paradise Lost renders the fall in ways analogous to this cognitive transformation. Third, I will probe how the poem attempts to describe God and how, by failing, it reveals the limits of 17th century, or rather, fallen, language. By fulfilling these goals, I hope to demonstrate that Paradise Lost not only evidences an epistemic shift, but draws on that shift to define its theology. My thesis begins with a question. Why does Paradise Lost depict not only depict the fall not only as man's first disobedience, but as a cosmological cataclysm that results in both an outrage from lifeless things that corrupts the natural world, and a corresponding zoological upheaval in which beast with beast gan war, and fowl with fowl, and my favorite, fish with fish. <laughs> not all fall narratives attribute such universal significance to the fall. Multiple medieval dramas depict the fall in one's words as an unhappy change of residence for Adam and Eve. In these earlier accounts, the fall leaves the world unperturbed, changing only the location and condition of its human inhabitants. In Paradise Lost and other contemporary accounts, the fall disrupts the world, overriding the legible creation that once made manifest God's imminent benevolence. I use the language of overriding and legibility deliberately because prior to the 17th century, Christians could intuitively accept the proposition of such a legible creation. They did so through their faith in Augustine's theology of the Book of the World. God, according to Augustine, communicates through creation. God's science, science to humanity populate the world in the form of plants, animals, and the environment itself. What Augustine and his pre-17th century followers accept as true of the world they inhabit, Milton posits as characteristic of the now lost prelapsarian world. And Milton is not alone. As historian Peter Harrison attests, 17th century epistemology assumes that, I quote, the presumed correspondence between the knowing subject and the known object, which had existed in the mind of Adam, had been severely disrupted by a radical corruption of human nature after the fall, and a collateral damage which extended to the whole sublunary world. To explain this conceptual shift, I turn to the work of Michel Foucault and Walter Ong. These Thinkers both pinpoint the 17th century as the moment of the conceptual shift I described at the beginning of this presentation, when symbols separated from their meanings, when writing overtook speech, and when humanity lost its embeddedness in the world. This final change most directly explains Milton's divergence from Augustinian thought. Milton does not share Augustine's connection to the world, so he cannot read the book of the world in the way Augustine once did. This lost connection, according to Paradise Lost, signals are fallenness. Foucault divides the 16th and 17th centuries in terms of the division between analogical and representational semiotics. Before and during the 16th century, language and other signs rely on buried similitudes 
indicated on the surface of things, which provide visible marks for invisible analogies. Put more simply, according to analogical semiotics, language is part of the world. It is not a tool we construct and impose on it. The world communicates, and God communicates through it. In the 17th century, however, the written word ceases to be included among the signs and forms of truth. Language is no longer one of the figurations of the world, or a signature stamped upon things since the beginning of time. Signs become sy systems that we create, systems that derive meaning from one another rather than from their innate connection to God's book. <coughs> While Foucault diagnoses this conceptual division between analogical language embedded in the world and representational language imposed on it, Walter Ong identifies both a cause and a set of implications. For Ong, the 17th century divides a world that takes language as primarily spoken from one that takes it as primarily written. This distinction seems a minute one, Ong, however, unearths a litany of metaphysical consequences. To Ong, spoken words, which define reality for, or for oral cultures, are events engaged in time and indeed in the present. As oral and experiential reality give way to textual and conceptual reality, the world itself loses its connect connectedness with humanity, making the human subject a kind of stranger, a spectator and manipulator in the universe, rather than a participator. We become bracketed, isolated subjects in a deadened world, a stark, apparently fallen contrast to Augustine's theophanic cosmos. Having established the intellectual history through which I read Milton, I now turn to the text itself. For the rest of this presentation, I will explore Paradise Lost through the lens Foucault and Ong provide. First, by examining how the poem depicts the fall, then by discussing how its own language evidences the fall's lingering effects. Milton, as if anticipating Foucault's divisions, casts the fall in terms of transparent analogical signs in the unfallen world and ambiguous representational ones in the fallen. Paradise Lost juxtaposes the first humans and Satan, characterizing the former before their fall, as intrinsically legible symbols, and the latter as an instable, indeterminate sign. Unfallen Adam and Eve are exactly what they seem. There is no disjuncture or instability separating their appearance from their state of being. In contrast, Satan exemplifies all of the 17th century's anxieties about representational language. Protean and deceptive, Satan fundamentally opposes God's legible order. Theologically, Adam and Eve's semiotic transparency corresponds to their status as the Imago Dei, the image of God. As the Archangel Raphael recognizes, they resemble God inward and outward both. They are analogical, not representational signs. When Satan tempts Adam and Eve, he does so by disrupting this relationship. His temptation mounts a two-pronged attack on the analogical semiotics that connect God to humanity to God and to the world. First, Satan leads Adam and Eve to perceive their world through the perspective of representational fallen semiotics. Second, this ep epistemological temptation causes Adam and Eve to change internally, becoming images of themselves in a mediated representational sense, rather than, a purely, analo rather than purely analogical images of both themselves and God. This twofold semiotic transformation is, in Paradise Lost, the fall. To convince Eve to take the, the fruit, Satan teaches her to perceive her condition through fallen representational semiotics. Adam describes the tree of knowledge of good and evil as the only sign of our obedience left among so many signs of power and rule conferred upon us. From the analogical perspective that informs the book of the world, this definition is a reasonable one, since everything functions as a sign articulating something about God and humanity. Before the fall, all of creation constitutes this kind of sign. From a representational perspective, however, the tree as sign takes on wholly different connotations, Linking signifier and signified is an arbitrary process in Milton's new episteme. Language users affix symbols to a fundamentally distinct world as an attempt to impose order on it. In this context, Adam's definition suggests that God designated the tree as a symbol of obedience, regardless of any intrinsic property of that tree. That God hath pronounced death to taste the tree would transform from meaning that God's linguistic creativity spoke a lethal tree into being 
to meaning that God labeled the tree a sign of obedience and employed a threat of lethal force to secure that imposed symbolic valence. When interpreting Adam's understanding of the tree, analogical semiotics suggests Adam and Eve's benevolent maker omnipotent, while representational semiotics suggests Satan's tyranny of heaven. To corrupt Eve, then, Satan must convince her to perceive the world as though she were already fallen. Satan relies on sophisticated, sophistic paradox to persuade Eve that God cannot hurt ye and be just, not just not God, not feared then, nor obeyed. Satan posits God's identity as contingent and conditional, something potentially separable from God himself. Satan continues to redefine signifiers as unstable, claiming that, just as the forbidden fruit made him, as his serpentine alias, of human, a brute human, it can now make Adam and Eve of human gods. When Eve decides to eat the fruit, she adopts Satan's paradoxical logic. Just as Satan reasoned that your fear itself of death removes the fear, Eve reasons that God forbids us then to taste the fruit, but this forbidding commends it more. Satan precipitates Eve's fall by convincing her of a disjuncture between signifier and signified, that something in God's legible creation could actually mean the opposite of what it suggests. When Satan succeeds, the fall transforms how Adam and Eve function as images. They become self-conscious, potentially misguiding signif signifiers of themselves. Or practically speaking, they both develop, develop a concern for self-representation. Adam, for example, covered himself to hide his fallenness, although his robe uncovered more about his compromised moral position. Unfallen, he had no need to construct his appearance, no need to signify his intrinsic moral uprightness. Likewise, in her first post-lapsarian monologue, Eve asks to Adam, what, in what sort shall I appear, debating whether to make known as yet my change or to keep the odds of knowledge in my power. With her, her post-lapsarian interiority, Eve recognizes herself as able to present an image, one that could, but does not necessarily, signify reality. Her fall creates a fissure between herself and her appearance. Adam and Eve have expressed their thoughts through dialogue throughout the poem. Now, though, Eve specifically addresses herself, suggesting both self-reference and self-representation. Eve's self and her language turn inward as she becomes her own interlocutor. Further, Eve decides to be honest with Adam because of the fear that she could die and be replaced by another Eve who would marry Adam. Eve's anxieties marry, mirror the replicability of the written word, the kind of language privileged in the 17th century. While a spoken word changes depending upon the identity and tone of its speaker, the same combination of letters unfailingly constitute the same written word. Her fears also mirror Satan's redefinition of godliness from an intrinsic identity to a losable and achievable status. The identity of Eve becomes unmoored from Eve herself. In her fallen perspective, she becomes replicable and thus replaceable. In the final portion of my thesis, I shift focus from the fallenness of Paradise Lost's characters to that of its narrator. Milton's narrates from a post-lapsarian perspective, relying on fallen language. As a result, Milton's language cannot connect him with God in the way that Augustine's unfallen analogical language could. To demonstrate this dissonance between God in the poem and God as properly understood, I rely on the dual example of the father and the muse. The father purports to represent God in Paradise Lost, although he is too thoroughly anthropomorphized to represent an omnipotent God beyond time. Although the muse comes closer to representing this atemporality, the poem rigorously separates her identity from God's. These portrayals of God gesture toward their incompleteness, engaging in what Foucault describes as the action of a representation that stands back from itself, that duplicates and reflects itself in another re representation that is its equivalent. The action of 17th century representational language. Together, the father and the muse circumscribe Paradise Lost's inability to linguistically represent God, an inability resultant from the poem's necessary reliance on the language it identifies as fallen. Making God into a character is 
unavoidably, an act of personification. Even placing God onto the timeline of a narrative risks suggesting that God is a temporal being, rather than something outside of time. God the Father in Paradise Lost succumbs to this problem of representation. Personified, the Father speaks, sees, hears, and even apparently changes his mind. He functions within the poem's timeline, bound to its chronology. Although the Father knows in ways beyond linear time, he has foreknowledge that Satan shall pervert Adam and Eve before it happens in the narrative, and in the same speech recalls that humans themselves decreed their own revolt, this knowledge does not allow the Father to overcome his representational status. The Father's grammar shifts on the poem's timeline, but the Father himself does not. Even if he did, occupying multiple spaces on a timeline differs from transcending and creating it. This disjuncture between the Father and his language suggests his representational rather than analogical role. His, dual, his dialogue serves to represent the temporal anteriority he cannot actually attain. While the Father purports to be God without resembling him, the Muse resembles God without claiming the identity. The Muse provides the creative force that continuously enables Paradise Lost to exist, meaning that, unlike the Father, she both transcends and sustains the narrative. Although, the muse, although Milton invokes the Muse four times, he never narrates the Muse's response, meaning that she, unlike the Father, is not a character. Milton begins three books, including the poem's first, with a prayer invoking the Muse's help, but the evidence of that help is not narrated within the frame narrative. It is, rather, the existence of the poem. Although the Muse does not assent in dialogue to giving her aid to, the muse, to Milton's adventurous song, the song undeniably exists. Instead of narrating the muse's bestowal of aid, Milton demonstrates it. In this way, the, the muse-poem relationship becomes a proxy for the relationship between God and creation. God's continuous emanation of divine energy perpetuates the world as the muse's continuous emanation of inspiration enables the creation and distrib distribution of Paradise Lost. The imminence and transcendence, the atemporality and immediacy of the muse allows her to stand in for God. Milton, however, qualifies this representation in one inescapable way. Paradise Lost rigorously divides the muse from the Son of God. This division indicates that while the muse functions similarly to God, she does not become him in the logic of the poem. The muse represents God, and true to representational semiotics, functions based on an understanding that she is a symbol. She is almost, but not quite, the spirit, who in turn is almost, but not quite, the sun. This oblique, incomplete linkage illustrates that the muse is not the sun, even if she represents him. When Paradise Lost hints at the incompleteness of this connection, it also hints at the reason for its incompleteness. At the start of book three, Milton asks the atemporal light that evokes God's son, may I express the unblamed? He asks this in the third line of the third invocation in the third book. This set of threes marks a Trinitarian allusion to the God he doubts he can express. Posing this question about unblamed expression also ties it to a later moment in the poem. Immediately before the fall, in which Milton mourns the end of the venial discourse unblamed that marked prelapsarian language. The word unblamed appears only once more in Paradise Lost, or in any of Milton's English poetry, in a description of the joy unblamed that humanity felt in its brief purified state after the flood. This joy unblamed ends with the construction of the Tower of Babel and the linguistic confusion that follows. These occurrences of the word, then, link it with spiritual and linguistic purity, if not actually prelapsarian, then nearly so. When Milton questions his ability to express the light unblamed, he doubts not only his poetic skill, but his ability to, to transcend the limitations of postlapsarian language. Milton's question, then, identifies both his inability to encompass the sun poetically and the underlying moral and linguistic conditions that cause it. The muse almost establishes a Miltonic theology of, of the sun as God's word. Were the muse the sun, 
Milton would make the poem the creation of God's word, making it part of God's creative act and part of the son's mediating task. While the muse represents God, though, she cannot become him. Fallen representational language fractures the poem's ability to mediate God to humanity through God's word. Thus, the implication of Adam and Eve's linguistic fall holds true. The language of Paradise Lost articulates the rift that the fall creates between humanity and an otherwise imminent God. Paradise remains lost. Thank you. Thank you.